Good morning, Iwu. Thank you for tuning in to Chapel this morning. We're so excited to see you back. Um, just one announcement for you guys this morning. Be sure after spring break to be keeping an eye out just on I Attended um, for our second round of figs. Uh, we're so excited for these and we hope you are too. That's all I have for you this morning. So um, let's go ahead and transition into a time of worship. We would just encourage you wherever you are to take a posture of worship to center um, your heart on Jesus. Jesus Christ our Lord.
grateful to be in this space once again and to get to worship you. God, while we may be spread across this campus, we are united in you and we are so grateful for that. God, I ask you to bless our speakers as they come and deliver a message today. God, let their words be what you want them to say. Let us hear what you want us to hear. God, I ask you to just um, keep us safe as we go into spring break. Help us to have a restful time, but to be safe and be smart. Help us to have safe travels and bring us all back together and let us worship once again. It's in your precious and holy name that we pray all of these things. Amen. Um, and thanks, Sydney and worship team for leading us in worship this morning. You know, all of our worship teams and really our sound, light, and media team too have just um, 
have been impacted by all the changes, particularly at chapel this semester, and more than anyone else. And they keep showing up every single week. They keep having a good attitude and a servant's heart. And I'm just so proud of all of those students. They're incredible. So, um, hey, look, I have somebody here with me this morning. This is my husband, Jeremy Summers. Some of you maybe have had him in class here on campus. Um, but we get, to, we get to preach today, and I'm really excited about that. That's awesome. So Jeremy and I spent a stint of time uh, not too terribly long ago in Georgia. We lived in Georgia. Um, So we're still adjusting to all the snow and all the weather here. Uh, But the house that we lived in in Georgia backed up to these woods and there were bears that would go like loping through our backyard. We had bears that lived in those woods. This is the other thing that no one warned me about before we moved to Georgia and it is the copperhead snakes Mm -hmm. they we found them like you would be doing yard work on a regular basis our children would be outside playing and they'd be like oh look mommy a baby snake and (laughs) did you know that like baby copperheads are actually so much more poisonous than adult copperheads because they i don't know they like can't regulate the poison anyway scared me i hate snakes scared me to death one time remember that time that you were out there Mm -hmm. You were like clearing brush. Clearing a lot of brush. <laughs> and there was one about a foot from my face. Yeah. And so I freaked out. Um, and so my instinct was to kill it. But I froze. For you some told, reason, I could not. This is how I remember it. Because um, you, know, you know how everyone in like a stressful situation, there's like, there's, f- there's fight, there's flight, and there's freeze. I was flight. I was like running away, (laughs) screaming, Jeremy, help, you know, like, Jesus, help us, you know. And, um, but I remember turning around once I was a good 10 feet away and looking at you and you literally had the shovel like poised over. Ready to kill it. I think you had like, somehow the snake must have gotten, you know, injured or something in your yard work. Yeah. Because it wasn't, it was just, it was like looking up at you. Yeah. Kind of like, please Ready to strike. Well, yeah, it was, it was this moment where I was like, he has to kill it now. <laughs> and you looked over at me and you said, I can't do it. Yeah. I just can't do it. And you just, so you're probably, so sweet. You have this soft heart. You yeah, can't kill exactly. things. Yeah. And so it was me or the snake. And the, so, um, our neighbor though, uh, his name's Sean, um, had a gun. And he was someone who just... We lived in Georgia. Yeah, lots just, of guns. Lots okay. of guns. Uh, <laughs> and he had one. And he was actually with his family at the park. So I called up, called up Sean. I'm like, Sean, man, like, yeah, can you help me with the snake? He's like, I'll be there in a second. So he drives literally like one minute, unloads the kids, and he shows up, goes inside, grabs his gun, takes the snake by the rake, and takes it out back and takes care of it. It was basically like a scene from like a Quentin Tarantino movie or something yeah. like that. It, I mean, was it was like, yeah. it was, there was violence. We'll there just, was we'll violence. put it that way. Yeah. So in this moment of pressure, my response is to run. Mm-hmm. Your response is to freeze. And Sean's, and Sean's response is to fight. <laughs> fight, I'll take care of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And it was, I mean, there was a little bit of fear involved in that and being afraid of what's next and also overcoming this idea of of taking care of that snake. But I think when we look at uh, some of the deeper areas of life um, of fear, um, fear is something that a lot of times controls us. And as you mentioned, there are three things that we typically lean into when we deal with fear. And that is fight, which we want to do everything in our own will to take care of it. Another one is flight, which tends to be those that avoid fear. We just want to push it away. We don't want even to acknowledge it. We're so fearful that we want to avoid it. And the third one is freeze. And with freeze, this is when our logic and reason isn't present. Uh, We just become more inward and we begin to process so much that we don't, we kind of lose control. And so uh, with, with this idea of fear, we land in some of these camps here. And sometimes we can be all three at once and fear is real. Um, But uh, I'd like to show you a video because I know Enneagram is very popular, um, kind of mainstream right now, but it's very popular on campus. And for some of us, we know our Enneagram, right? We know what type we are. Uh, For some of us, even when I say the word Enneagram, you're like, all right, I'm done, I'm out. (laughs) And then for some of us, we're like, okay, I'm all in. 
so all in that I think if you're watching with a group of people, you can turn to someone right now and say, you're Enneagram this, right? I know your type. Um, so we're going to show this clip um, of two types of how they react to this idea of fear. No, I keep losing at deals, and I don't want to make a deal anymore. And a very, very calm day into this. A bump in the road comes, and she be sarcastic. Curtis. I won't be coming back until Saturday when you leave. She's going to try to stop me, but she can't run those little high heels. Never see this face again. So in this clip, one of the funniest things is that kid, man. I mean, that kid was hilarious. Enneagram 7, by Enneagram the way, 7, right? Yeah, Enneagram <laughs> 7 for sure. But I mean, I'm in my mind, I'm just thinking, if he was my kid, I'd be like, okay, you're in timeout. You're going to go outside and take a run or give me 20 right now. Um, and those eights, for you watching those two ladies at it, um, you resonate with that. And so for some of you, you're like, yep, I've done that. But those are some just kind of a humorous way of looking at fear and how we might act out on it in some unhealthy ways. But yet when you look at 2 Timothy verse 1, God has not given us a spirit of fear. I mean, God has not given us this, this spirit, this understanding of living life through fear. Yet it's the opposite. God has given us a spirit to love, to hope, to live by faith. And fear, however, for many of us has become this habitual habit this is something that we live by. This is something that through fear, it controls us. We make decisions out of fear. Sometimes fear is so much in us and through us that we can't even identify what we were before embracing this concept of fear. But even when I talk about fear and in starting to talk about how does God want us to live, for many of us, we sit back and we're like, I've heard this before. I've heard this before. You're, you're wanting me to let go of this and just give it to God. Or you want me to just talk to someone about this idea of fear and it'll just go away. I mean, you don't know who I am. You don't know where I've come from. You don't know the things I deal with. And that is true. Because for some of us, it's not easy. It's not easy to live in this life of fear. But God did not design us, create us in this way. I mean, scriptures are filled with passages that say, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Because as we will learn, there is another way. Yeah, I think, I think there is another way. And um, what if we told you today, what if we suggested that there is another way to understand fear? Um, what if we told you that fear is actually a signpost of God's promises in your life? What if we understood fear as something that we don't have to respond to necessarily? I mean, <clears throat> there's that fight and there's that flight and there's that freeze, those kind of innate like reactions that we have to fear, but in the middle of that, that maybe God is inviting us to, to sit with him in our fear, that he wants to sit in it with us. He wants to help us uncover all the layers because I wanna suggest something this morning that fear can be a clue to a lie that is hidden underneath. That, that if we take that fear and if we allow God to like unpack it for us and unwrap it for us, that rooted underneath that fear is actually a lie. 
And that lie is, is what's causing some of that fear. So <clears throat> let me just like give an example of this. This is maybe a silly illustration, <laughs> but uh, you guys know how colanders work, right? Like you boil pasta on, on the stove and when it's done boiling, um, you pour the hot water into the colander, all the water passes through and the pasta stays there, right? And this is really how discernment works in our life. Like with the cooperation of the Holy Spirit, that discernment allows the truth to come through like we, we use discernment, to, uh, it's really a gift. It allows, dis, it allows truth to come through and sit in our life, but it keeps the lies out. But here's the thing, we're so broken. <laughs> we're so broken by sin in our life, by sin that has been committed against us. Some of you, your earliest memories are connected to horrible lies that were spoken over you, to hurtful things that were committed against you. And so those things really, it, it serves to like, if we go back to that kind of stupid colander illustration that like it, it leaves these cracks in the colander. It leaves these huge gaping holes that what was supposed to be left out and kept out, it passes through. And so those lies come through and they pen penetrate our lies and we begin to believe what it is that was said over us. We start to believe the things that that relationship spoke over us and we start to believe those lies. Our discernment is broken. We don't know what's truth and what's lie anymore. It's all just this like jumbled mess in our lives. And so those lies in our life sometimes leave us afraid. They leave us with this fear, these fears like you're always gonna be alone or if people really knew what, all these things about you, they wouldn't love you or this area of sin in my life isn't really so bad. These lies that we start to believe and we start to own and they start to become more real than the actual truth in our lives. So, so, so what we're talking about today is what if we named that fear and sat with it, allowed God to sit in the middle of that fear with us, and that we helped, we, that the Holy Spirit helped us to identify the lie that we've believed at the root of that fear. I can think of a number of conversations that I've had even with, with students this, this year that have gone something to the effect of, well, you know, if people really knew this thing about me, um, if they knew that story as a part of my past, then they would, they'd be like, see you later, peace out. But like in the very same breath, I'll have a student say something like that and then like 30 seconds later, they're saying something to me like, well, if I, you know, other people have been through things that are so much worse than what I've been through in my life and I don't wanna burden people with my story. I don't wanna burden people with my, like it's, it's these two literally opposite things coming from the same person and they're both working as lies in their life to isolate them. No, just... Just keep that on the down low. Just keep it to yourself. Just stay over here in the dark. Don't bring it out into the light. And that's John 8, 44. I mean, John lays it bare for us when he says that the enemy, that Satan is the father of lies. Like literally, this is his native tongue. This is how he speaks. It's all lies. For me, looking at, at lies and how that's impacted me, um, one of the lies that I dealt with for some time and dealt with some trauma that I won't get into here and things that Andrew and I are actually still working through. But these lies for me, I had to identify. Uh, through this trauma, I would sit back and think, God, are you even here? Are you even present? Can you even acknowledge that I'm with you? Um, and some of those lies that I kept feeding myself through, is God even with me? Is God gonna fix these things? Uh, began to fester. And as I continued to freeze, as I continued to avoid, as I continued to try to fight with my own strength and will, I became isolated. I became isolated from other people, from the word of God. I had to identify this later on in life. And for some time, I was like, man, if I could have only identified this sooner, what would my life have looked like? And yet through the lens of this idea of releasing, of acknowledging. You see, Satan wants to drive this wedge between us and God. 
And so when I think of these lies that we tend to believe, some things that come to mind is, is God enough? Is God enough? Or I have to perform to be loved or accepted. That what I do is who I am. And so I have to keep trying, I have to keep going, whether it's in academics or athletics, or maybe your professor and it's, do I teach this way? Or is it, you know, intellectual ego, whatever those things might be that I'm trying to overcome. Or maybe I can't overcome this sin. We just feed this lie. If I can't do it, I'm just gonna, this is just the way I am. Hmm. Or maybe it's deeper than that in some ways of feeling loved. Am I loved? Or if someone actually knew who I am, who I really am, when I take off this jersey, or when I go and sit in my dorm room by myself, or when I'm driving home after work, will people really still love me or like me for who I really am? You see, one of the first steps in this is actually identifying what is your fear? What is your fear? Hmm. And here's the thing, though. Like, that, you know, for me, (laughs) you shared a little bit, too. Like, I, there was a period, and Jeremy and I were dating at the time, so he knows this, but, like, as a student here at Indiana Wesleyan a long, long time ago, um, (laughs) I, I, I didn't know, I didn't have language for it. I didn't know it was anxiety attacks that I was experiencing at the time. But looking back on it now, I know that's what it was. And I was crippled by this fear, this lie that I come to believe that if I fail, that I, I had connected love, I had connected acceptance to my success somehow. And if I fail, if I screw it up, I don't know who's still gonna be there for me. And I was just so crippled under the weight of all the pressure I was putting under myself. Um, but here's the thing, wherever your deepest longings and desires are in your life, like your fear is connected to whatever that deep desire and longing. And chances are that that desire and longing that God has placed in your life, it is from God. Like it, is, it is not inherently a sinful thing that that desire is something. You're longing to be loved. You're longing to be known. You're longing to have a purpose for your life and to have meaning, all these wonderful things. But the thing is that sometimes those desires, when they are co-opted by the enemy, like if he wants to take those things and twist them and make them into something that are not, that they lead to sin and death. In fact, that's what James says in James 1, 14 through 15. It says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. I mean, James lays it out there for that These desires, if, if the enemy can come in and he can twist those desires for us, if he can um, convince us that there's some shortcut to getting those desires, that there's some, some way we can circumvent the process, um, he comes in and he twists that and those desires end up leading, James says, to sin and to death. But I have a friend, when she talks about her longings and her desires in her life, she refers to them as God's promises. I love that. That idea that our deepest longings and desires in our life are actually God's promises yet unfulfilled. Because isn't that the truth? That our desires are only fulfilled in him at the end of the day. I mean, 2 Corinthians 1.20 says exactly that. It says, for as many as are the promises of God, In Christ, they are all answered, yes. So through him, we say our amen to the glory of God. We have these longings and desires in our lives and we can go one of two directions with those. We can claim them as God's promises, perhaps yet unfulfilled, but claim them as God's promises in our lives or we can allow the enemy to, you know, when that, when that, colander gets broken and cracked and damaged and our discernment is broken and we're not listening to the Holy Spirit, we can allow those lies to penetrate and to twist and circumvent and shortcut those desires and they end up leading to sin and death. I think that we see such a good um, example of what this actually looks like in a real person's lives in, in Luke chapter eight. Yep. So what we find here in Luke chapter eight is a woman who is hemorrhaging. She is, is bleeding and she's suffered from this for 
going on 12 years, we're told. And in that time, she's unclean, she's uncomfortable, she's not being comforted, she's almost being pushed away from society, those around her. So she wouldn't be allowed in this time to eat with others, to even enter the synagogue. And she spent every penny that she had, every resource that she had to be cured, to find a cure. So you almost can see in this passage, uh, this woman coming, trying to seek Jesus out in the crowd, but yet as she's seeking, there's this built of shame that's over her. Yeah. And as she approaches Jesus, there's no doubt of why she approached Jesus from behind when you actually understand what she's going through. See, she longs to be healed, but she can't necessarily confront Jesus in the crowd because of what's happening around her. So she tries to approach, approach him without actually being noticed. So you have to wonder, what is the fear? What is driving this in her? Mm -hmm. Is it this thought of, I'm dirty, I'm, I'm un unworthy, I can't be loved? I mean, is God actually going to bless me, to heal me in this? Has God forgotten about me? I mean, 12 years. Mm -hmm. Think of the things that you have been dealing with. Mm -hmm. And for such time, it's no wonder these questions that she has. And yet she touches Jesus's robe and immediately she's healed. And yet for many of us, this is where we would stop. This is where we would celebrate and say, Jesus has healed me of this. And yet for Jesus, what we see here is that it's not the physical that he just wants to heal, but something more. And we'll see where this real miracle happens. Yeah, so here she is, she's physically healed. She got what it was that she came for. And yet the passage keeps going because the real miracle still is waiting to happen. So we pick up in Luke chapter eight in verse 45, Jesus asks, who touched me? And it's a, it's a question that kind of reminds me a little, it reminds me of Adam and Eve in the garden a little mm -hmm. bit because you know, Adam and Eve, they've sinned, they're in shame, they're in hiding and God says, where are you? Like, come on now, like God knows where they are, right? This is God inviting Adam and Eve out of the shadows, out of hiding. And I, I see this same kind of invitation right here. Jesus, he knows who touched him, <laughs> but he says, who touched me? Because he's inviting her out of hiding. And so, so in verse 47, then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet in the presence of all the people. She told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. And then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you, go in peace. It wasn't enough for her to just be physically healed. Jesus called her out of her fear, called her out of her lies and all the shame that was attached to those. And he says, come on, I've got more for you. Like, I know you've been physically healed. You think you got what you came for, but I have more in store for you. It, Jesus understands this woman's hurt. He understands her trauma. He understands her pain. And he knows exactly how to unearth that without destroying her. And he does for you too. He knows how to unearth those lies and the shame and the fear connected to those without destroying you. He wants to restore you. He wants to restore you. So what are some practical steps in this? I mean, how do we go beyond just identifying what our fears are? Because I guarantee you right now, you can identify what that fear is. What are you afraid of? What is that lie? And so when we see this, we see in the story that one of the first things that we have to do is we have to listen. Are we listening to the voice of Jesus? Do we hear him speaking to us? And one of the best ways to hear the voice of God is through his word. As we talked about, Satan wants to drive that wedge. And one of the best ways to break that is to invite the voice, the word of God into our life. John 8 says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth 
will set you free. Like this woman, she was set free because she heard and she responded. And so for us, in hearing the voice of God, some of us need to look at his truth. What is God actually saying to us? How has God shaped us? How has God formed us? What is our true identity? And in doing that, we begin to reveal and God begins to restore us through that. So for some of us, you might say, my past defines me. My past defines me. My past is just kind of this rerun. I just keep reliving the past. And scripture would say, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Maybe for some of you, the lie is God has forgotten about me. For some of you, you're about to graduate. Or maybe for some of you, you've been holding on to these lies for some time and you're worried about your future, about what's next. And scripture would say, it is Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. Long before we heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us. He designed us for a glorifying living, part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and in everyone. Mm-hmm. For some of you, one of the lies might be, I'm not worth anything. I'm not worth anything. And you've been dealing with this for a long time. But God's truth says, you are a living stone which has been rejected by people, but it is God who sees you as precious in his sight. So how do we listen? What is God saying to you? I think we see the woman doing this too, you know, like she heard Jesus' voice and there was this thing that kind of that called her out. And this is, this is what scripture does for us. It, it heals those, that broken colander, that broken discernment that we have. It, mm-hmm. it knits it back together again. And I think, so it, we listen to God's voice is the first thing that we do. The second thing we do is we step out of hiding. We see the woman do this. We step out of hiding because we need other people to help us. We can't mend that broken colander. We can't mend that broken discernment all by ourselves. We need scripture and we need other people to help us with that as well. Here's this woman who she could have frozen. She could have run away. She could have just put her head down. She could have, she didn't have to respond to God's, to Jesus' invitation in that moment, right? But she did. She responded and it took incredible courage. I think the number one lie that, that many of us are dealing with right now is this, this lie of isolation because it's in isolation that our sin and our shame flourish. And so listen, if you hear a voice that is saying, stay hidden, withdraw some more, just keep it over here because no one can possibly understand If you hear that voice, I just want to tell you right now, that is not the voice of God. Because Jesus' voice will always do what it did for this woman. It will call us out of hiding. It'll take courage, but it will call us towards him. It will call us towards the crowd, towards other people. I just want to suggest that God is offering you, offering us an invitation today. He's saying, where are you? like he said to Adam and Eve in the garden. He's saying, who touched me? He's calling us out of fear and to to, to sit with him in the middle of that fear and to find what is at the root of that fear, what is that lie? And to realize that actually at the root of that lie is a desire that God has placed in your heart and in your life that is a good desire. And that it is not a desire that you want the enemy to come in and to twist and to shortcut into something it was never meant to be. So the invitation today is not just to be honest with God. The invitation is to reach out to someone. I'm gonna challenge you. Like we're gonna challenge you to do that today to reach out, I don't know what that means for you, if you need to reach out to a professor, a chaplain, an RA, an RD, if you need to call your parents and tell them what's really going on, if you need to text a friend, whatever you need to do to take those steps out of hiding. You hear this, this this woman, it said that she fell at Jesus' feet trembling. She was scared to death. She told her whole story, not just for Jesus, but for everyone who was standing in the crowd listening that day. And I wanna tell you that Jesus' voice is calling you out of hiding today. He is saying, you know that desire that you have? They are my promises in your life that are yet 
unfulfilled. Don't try to shortcut what I have for you. Listen to my voice. Come out of hiding. Let me sit with you. Let, let's put your discernment back together with my help, with the help of the Holy Spirit, with the help of other people in your life. And as we close, one of the last things that Jesus tells the woman mm-hmm. is to go in peace. That when we live this out, that we are restored, we are made whole, and that we can actually go in peace, that we can live a life of what it means to be free, a life with God, because now we understand who we really are. So as we close in prayer, I'm just gonna pray a special prayer over each of you. And in this prayer, my longing is that you will connect with someone, but that you will also hear the voice of God and experience these words of go, go in peace. Let us pray. Dear Father God, we are so thankful for your word. We are so thankful for your love for us, that we are made in your image, that our identity is in you and through you. God, may we identify today, may we name it out loud, what that fear is, what is that lie? May we identify it and then may we invite someone else in this process. And in that invitation, inviting someone in the process that we understand that you are still very much present with us throughout this journey. And in this process, Lord, may we find healing, transformation, and through this, Lord, may we experience your peace and love. As you said to this woman, as we say to everyone listening today, may we go in peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and your Holy Spirit, amen.